Welcome, and thank you for participating in today's edition of the Department of Energy's Solar Decathlon webinar series, what we call virtual sessions, which will address Solar Student Leaders of Tomorrow Showcase. My name is Jonathan Cohen, and I run the Solar Decathlon virtual session webinar series with your Department of Energy. First, let me share what the Solar Decathlon is. It's a collegiate competition that consists of 10 contests, which challenge student teams to design and build highly efficient and innovative buildings powered by renewable energy. The competition features two tracks, a design challenge and a build challenge. The Solar Decathlon provides a hands-on experience and unique training that pre prepares the competing students to enter the clean energy workforce. But the Solar Decathlon is more than a competition. It's an intensive learning experience for consumers and homeowners and students as they experience the latest technologies and materials in energy efficient design, clean energy technologies, and smart home solutions, uh, as well as water conservation measures, electric vehicles, and high performance buildings. Participation since the first Solar Decathlon was held in 2002 has involved more than 465 collegiate teams from around the world and more than 23,000 collegiate participants. And with that, we are very pleased to feature today's session, again, which is the Solar Student Leaders of Tomorrow Showcase. So if we go on to our next slide, we just very quickly want to share what our uh, agenda is so you have a sense of what to expect. And we also have a few ground rules for our Q&A session in particular. So in terms of the agenda, we're going to hear from, uh, uh, after I'm done speaking, I'm going to hand the reins over to Tony Smith from uh, uh, the organization that has brought all of the speakers together today, uh, Secure Futures, and he is going to introduce our student speakers, uh, Carolyn Miller, Sherilyn Crookshanks, Jack Silgato, and Lauren Rhodes, and then we have an extra special guest uh, in Jeremy Hoffman, the Chief Scientist at the Science Museum of Virginia. Following that, we will have a Q&A where you can ask questions of the speakers and, and learn more. So with that, we only have uh, 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 one ground rule, which is that um, when you are asking questions, uh, please, if you are from a business, no uh, advertisements in terms of your business. Uh, we just want to have a good discussion about what the students have presented and what Jeremy's going to present as well. So with that, we're going to go on to our next one. And we are going to share what the upcoming Solar Decathlon virtual sessions are, which is in uh, their monthly and in Wednesday, uh, in January, excuse me, on Wednesday, January 20th, We'll hear Resilient Home 411, Strategies to Weather and Recover from Natural Disasters. Then in February, we'll hear about Zero Energy Ready Homes, New and Growing Fast. And then in March, The Future of Solar, a tour of cutting edge solar research with the Department of Energy's Solar Office. And then in April and May, we will hear from Solar Decathlon uh, participants as well, including the winners in May. So next slide, please. Now, in terms of the asking questions part, when it is that time, here's the functionality on your screen. You can either virtually raise your hand to ask a question and then be unmuted, or you can just chat in your question into the chat box, in which case we will read those questions off uh, at that time. But do chat them in as you think about them, because you might not remember them after a little time goes by, and then we can also just have them at the ready. So we'll go on to our next slide, please. And we are pleased to uh, now introduce our first speaker. And this is also the person who is responsible for bringing today's speakers together. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Anthony Tony Smith, who brings over 40 years experience in energy efficiency, solar energy, and community economic development in Vermont, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Virginia. Tony founded Secure Futures in 2004 as president and leads the company's financing innovation, development, and strategic partnerships. He holds a PhD from the Wharton School of Management at the University of Pennsylvania. And so with that, I'm going to turn the reins over to Tony to take us from here. Tony, over to you. 
Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and thank you for your kind introduction and especially to you and your entire team for inviting our Virginia Solar students or student leaders uh, to participate in this webinar. It's a great honor for us and especially for our students and the public schools that they're a part of. So um, I'm pleased to uh, be part of this. Uh, as Jonathan mentioned, we're a Virginia-based solar development company, and I personally have devoted much of my career as a social entrepreneur and educator working both in urban and rural communities to help create jobs and build wealthier communities by investing in energy efficiency and renewable energy. Our company is very intentionally a B Corps certified solar development company, which means we focus on the tri triple bottom line of people, planet, and profits. By example, we were the first mover in Virginia in developing solar power purchase agreements to make solar more affordable for public schools, universities, housing authorities, and hospitals starting in 2010, which now seems like a very long time ago. <laughs> we have served as policy leaders in Virginia to help remove legislative barriers to solar, including legalizing solar power purchase agreements in Virginia in 2013. We conduct research on our solar projects to learn how they work to save our customers money and also how they contribute to cooler roofs by as much as 30 to 60 degrees in the summer. As we were starting to collect this kind of research on cooling roofs, we connected with Dr. Jeremy Hoffman at the, the Science Museum to see how our cool solar findings corresponded with his research on urban heat islands. And presto, we found a great connection uh, with Jeremy, and we discovered a mutual commitment to engaging students as citizen scientists through project-based learning. And this is what led to a, a unique partnership to develop a pilot program we call Throwing Solar Shade to bring rooftop solar into the classroom. Next slide. So this slide highlights some of the key elements of the Throwing Solar Shade program. It was designed as a 10-week pilot. We designed the curriculum in consultation with our project partners and with teachers. And our purpose was to not only expose students to climate science and solar, but to also invite them to exercise their critical thinking, creativity, and the other five C's of learning through projects they designed themselves. And you'll learn about five C's in a second. And we purposely involved a rural and urban school district to engage students through and across geographic areas with many thanks to Augusta County Public Schools and the City of Richmond Public Schools for their uh, early and very uh, enthusiastic participation. Next slide, please. So our partners include not only ourselves and the Science Museum and the two public school systems, but also the Virginia Commonwealth University that we engaged as a third party evaluation team. And uh, especially as well, the National Energy Education Development Project based in Manassas, Virginia, which is a national organization organized by teachers and for teachers to bring solar curriculum into the classroom. Mm -hmm. And lastly, of course, the Community Foundation of Greater Richmond that provided some seed funding to cover uh, uh, teacher stipends and also transportation so students could travel from their schools to the Science Museum for their final uh, presentations. Next slide, please. So, um, VCU discovered, uh, much to our uh, great excitement, that uh, they, they were able to empirically measure growth in the five C's, the critical thinking, communication, collaboration, creativity, and citizenship. And these skills are a very key component uh, for the new profile at the Virginia Department of Education. Next slide. Um, our closing event, as I mentioned earlier, was held at the Science Museum of Virginia, which is a great opportunity for both rural and urban students to share their findings and to um, 
uh, share the excitement of what they had learned with with each other and uh, with their teachers. It was a wonderful uh, event and many thanks to the Science Museum for hosting this event. Next slide. Um, and of course, the teachers and curriculum instructors for Augusta Public School Systems were very excited because this not only uh, strengthened the five C's, but also their STEM research goals. They found through the VCU uh, evaluation that these students had made significant, uh, measurable improvements in their STEM uh, content knowledge through this 10 week program. Next slide, please. And of course, this kind of finding was mirrored as well from the city of Richmond Public Schools. And both school systems, of course, are tremendously excited about their students' participation in this evening's event, which, oddly enough, originally was going to be held in July before COVID had uh, other ideas for us. But we have persevered uh, by have, uh, participating in this uh, virtual event. Next slide, please. So our our thinking uh, has been to try out this try this out as a small scale pilot with two public school systems, one rural, one urban, and building on the success of this uh, and uh, the intervention of COVID, we decide to skip a year and uh, move towards a 2021 program, which would have more partners, more uh, schools and teachers participating. And by, by, by the fact that we've all learned to operate um, more effectively in virtual environments, we think that this could happen um, very well through distance learning uh, approaches. And uh, with that, I want to uh, turn this over to the four student stars, starting with Caroline Miller. Caroline? Hi, all. My name is Caroline Miller. I'm a senior at Fort Defiance High School and Shenandoah Valley Governor School. Next slide, please. And I did my project on maximizing thermophotovoltaic cell efficiency. Next slide, please. My, product, my project began in the fall of 2019 when I was tasked with developing a presentation on a topic relating to solar energy. I decided to address one of the fleeting questions that I'd had for years. Why do solar panels have a flat surface? As I began to scour the internet for answers, I quickly realized that I wanted to perform an experiment of my own. I hypothesized that by increasing the surface area of a solar panel, its heat production would increase as well. While I thought that a textured surface would generate more heat, I didn't yet know at the time whether that was a benefit or a setback. I had no knowledge of any solar cells that could utilize heat in order to produce electricity. So that's where I began my research. Next slide, please. I quickly discovered that, yes, there are solar panels that utilize heat, and they're called thermophotovoltaic cells, otherwise known as TPV cells. TPV panels differ from normal silicon PV panels in that they're able to utilize heat that would normally decrease efficiency in PV cells. Although both types of solar panels have significant differences, they share common components that allow them to function, such as PN junctions and band gaps. The cause of the electrical field within solar cells is due to the PN junction, which utilizes two different types of semiconductor materials that you can see in the diagram on your left, the P type and the N type to give the emitter its negative charge and the absorber its positive one. When an electrical circuit is made between them, current can flow. As for the band gap, it refers to the energy difference that's present between the top of the valence band and the bottom of the conduction band, which you can also see in the diagram on your left. In order for electrons to jump the valence band to the conduction band, they have to receive energy from a particle, usually a photon, that's greater than or equal to the band gap energy. The diagram on your right gives you a more simplistic view of where this process occurs in the PV cell. PV cells use photons with wavelengths, commonly found in the visible light spectrum, to excite their electrons and produce electricity. TPV cells, however, use infrared radiation, photons with shorter wavelengths, to do the same thing. The downside to both types of solar cells is that they experience optical losses, which you can see in the diagram on your right. The goal of my experiment was to determine if a textured surface could minimize those losses and maximize efficiency. Next slide, please. 
Growing up in a small rural town such as Fort Defiance, I didn't have access to the most advantaged technology. I planned to use AutoCAD software to design the prototype, but the RAM capacity of the computers that I had access to didn't follow my same train of thought. I ended up using Tinkercad, which meant that I had a few elementary shapes to use, and hey, they were certainly better than nothing. I designed the base on the left so that the panel, the components of which you can see on the right, would attach to it at a 38 degree angle. This texture at the top of the panel was semicircular, the one below it was octagonal and pyramidal, and the lowest one was the flat plane, my control group. After many attempts to successfully print the plastic prototype, I began my experiment. Next slide, please. My methods and materials were basic. I used a temperature gun to collect data every 30 seconds for each surface type. I did this for a total of two hours. First, one hour under a 14 watt LED bulb, and then one hour under the sun. I entered each of the approximately 720 data points into Excel and graphed the results. Next slide, please. On the left, you can see that there was a minuscule difference in temperature between the surfaces when they were tested under artificial light. The difference between the octagonal pyramidal surface and the flat surface was only an average of 0.69 degrees Celsius. However, if you look at the graph on your right, you'll note that the difference increased to 2.09 degrees Celsius when the prototype was tested under the sun. Next slide, please. This graph illustrates the ability of both the octagonal pyramidal and the semicircular surface to read at a higher temperature than the flat surface, but only in certain conditions. The data you see here was collected for one hour under the sun, and as clouds rolled in and the sun began to set, the temperature difference between all three surface types began to decrease. This trend was interesting to say the least, and if I'd had more time, I would have performed more trials under similar conditions to determine why it occurred. This would come to be one of the many questions that I was left with after my experiment, and it's part of what made me want to keep researching solar energy after TSS concluded. Next slide, please. Based on the data shown in the previous graphs, I concluded that my hypothesis was supported. The textured surfaces did generate more heat than the flat surface. However, I began to wonder if the texture may be more efficient in the absorber and emitter, because that's where I thought the most optical losses occurred. This, of course, was an unfounded assumption, and it provoked even more questions, such as, where do the most optical losses occur in the solar panel? Does this location differ between PV and TPV cells? And because the absorber and emitter must withstand temperatures 1,026 degrees Celsius, would the increased heat due to the texture be too much for the cells to handle? The questions that I had after my experiment were pushed back on the back burner during the fall of 2019, which was largely due to midterm exams and the bundle of stress that is high school. However, these questions would continue to resurface as I began my, to, my internship with Secure Features. Next slide, please. My internship spanned from January of 2020 to the beginning of this school year, and during that time, I gained a lot of valuable experience on multiple fronts. I helped review the upcoming TSS program plans as a student who had experienced it firsthand, which allowed me to see both sides of the narrative. I also assisted with the development of a grant application that was aimed at helping students like me access technology that was not available in our rural areas, which will hopefully open the door for students to better participate in TSS as they work virtually. Next slide, please. Although I was able to participate in many activities and learn various skills throughout my internship, my favorite project was, by far, the perovskite research paper. I took every question generated from my thermophotovoltaics experiment and chipped away at each concept, discovering different types of solar cells that I didn't even know existed. One of those was the perovskite solar cell, which, which utilizes perovskites, minerals that have properties such as conductivity and magnetism, which is due to their unique structure. I dove into the research conducted by scientists at both NREL and Oxford PD, PV, and in the process, I was, of course, left with even more questions. I wanted to experiment with many concepts, one of which was lead-free lead perovskites and their effect on the environment. However, I understand that I haven't even scratched the surface of the science behind solar cells, and I'll need years more of education to get to a point where I can conduct experiments with others. I began the TSS program in 2019 with minimal interest in solar technology, but now it's central to my future. I wanted to become a scientist that works with anything biology related for as long as I can remember, but I didn't realize that that could have anything to do with solar technology. 
Currently, I hope to study bioengineering in college and use my education to work towards improving solar cells. I'm incredibly grateful to have this opportunity to share my research and passion with others, and I hope that the TSS programs can, expire, can inspire other students like me to explore the field of solar technology and what it offers. Thank you to everyone who is watching and to everyone who helped me to get here. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much, Carolyn, for that fantastic presentation. We really appreciate it. And now we're going to move on to our next presenter, and we're very pleased to welcome to the Solar Decathlon virtual stage, Sherilyn Krupchex. Sherilyn, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sherilyn Krupchex, and I'm a junior at Fort Defiance High School. Next slide, please. For my presentation, I looked into various solutions for reducing my high school's impact as a heat island, and I'd like to present to you, Paint Before You Park. Next slide, please. Now, before I explain my research, I'd like to go over a couple basics. A heat island is classified as an urban area that is significantly warmer than the area around it because the surface absorbs the sun's rays rather than reflect them. However, don't let the word urban fool you. Being from a rural area myself, I was curious about heat islands around my community. Come to find out that I didn't have to look too far because parking lots pose one of the greatest heat island problems of our modern world, which isn't surprising because of the asphalt's dark color. This led me to ask the question that became the foundation of my project and overall research. If asphalt was a lighter color, would its impact as a heat island be reduced? Next slide, please. At Fort Defiance, our parking lot isn't quite normal. We have a tradition of allowing students to paint their parking spot for a small fee as a fundraiser to support our art department. Knowing this, I went out and tested the temperature of the various paint colors to see how they compare to the asphalt as well as each other. As you can see, the paint has significant impact on the asphalt's temperature. The most impactful result I found was the almost 11 degree difference between the asphalt and an all white parking space in front of Fort's parking lot in the front. A similar trend was found in the idea that the lighter the color of the paint, the more the temperature got reduced, supporting the question that I asked as a basis for my project. Next slide, please. Now, I know that looking at charts full of numbers might not be everyone's favorite pastime, so I create a color-coded chart as a visual aid. I matched the color of the column as best I could to the paint's color so there could be an accurate representation of what I was working with. This also provides an easier way to see how the colors compare to the asphalt as well as each other. For example, note how some paint colors, such as the dark blue, actually increase the asphalt's temperature rather than reduce it. I didn't find this surprising because I knew that dark colors absorb heat while lighter colors tend to reflect it. This is why, in my hypothesis and throughout my project, I, focusing, I focused on lightening the asphalt surface. Next slide, please. After discovering the effect white paint had a single, on a single parking space, I looked into what it would take to paint Fort's entire parking lot white. Now, with our parking lot being about 142,000 square feet, this could cost us anywhere from $19,000 up to $85,000. Now, I know this is a wide range, but the cost depends on the type of paint used, and the number of layers needed also depends on the type of paint used. It's all interconnected. Next slide, please. To test my theory of the, a different number of layers having a different effect on the paint and the temperature, I performed a small experiment with two pieces of asphalt and white paint. I left one section unpainted and separated the other into three different sections, with each section having an added layer of paint. I placed the asphalt under a heat lamp for about 20 minutes before checking each section's temperature. The unpainted asphalt got up to 24 degrees Celsius, and the painted asphalt got down to 23 degrees Celsius when I tested the section that was painted with three layers of white paint. These results confirmed my second hypothesis of the more layers added, the more the temperature would be reduced. Next slide, please. After I experimented with the white paint, I looked into alternate solutions that other researchers and scientists had come up with or looked into. I found out that asphalt actually comes in different colors, one of them being pure white. It would cost 
up to $273,000 for Fort Defiance to repave our entire parking lot. Another solution I looked into was Cool Seal, a water-based asphalt seal coat. It was used in Los Angeles' Cool Pavement Project in 2015 and reduced heat emitted from the streets by up to negative 1.1 degrees Celsius or 30 degrees Fahrenheit. This seal coat lasts about seven years and would cost up my high school up to $100,000 to implement. Next slide, please. For a final simple comparison of the options for Fort's individual parking lot, we'll look into the price of each, how long they'll last, and a few basic pros and cons. Repaving with the pure white asphalt is the most expensive, being in the upper 200,000s cost-wise, but it would last about 20 years. Cool Seal, the asphalt seal coat, has been proven to reduce the heat emitted from parking lots, lasts about seven years, and would be around $90,000 as a rough estimate. Finally, painting Fort's parking lot white could cost anywhere from $19,000 up to $85,000, making it the cheapest, but it would have to be repainted every few years and be able to withstand the various weather hazards we experience here in Augusta County. Next slide, please. So what does this mean for Fort? Unfortunately, we don't have the budget to work with solutions such as repaving our entire parking lot or using Cool Seal because of the large size of our parking lot. However, our tradition and fundraiser of allowing students to paint our parking spaces helps turn this fee into a fundraiser. For those of you in a school system or even a simple business, I challenge you to look into the possibility of painting your own parking lot. You could post it as a fundraiser, like Fort Defiance, and raise money for your organization. If it seems simple, that's because it is. You'll be surprised at the impactful outcome that will result if you decide to join Fort Defiance in painting before you park. My name is Sherilyn Crookshanks, and thank you for allowing me to present today. Thank you very much, Sherilyn. We really appreciate that presentation and all the work that went into it. And now we are going to move on to our next speaker, but we are going to ask you to please do chat in questions that you have while students are making their presentations so you can uh, share them while they're fresh in your mind and we'll uh, pose them to the students when we get to the Q&A part of the program. And now we're going to move on to our next student speaker, and we are very pleased to welcome Jack Salgado to the Solar Decathlon virtual stage. Jack, the floor is yours. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Jack Salgado. I'm a student at Open High School and I'm here with uh, Secure Futures to do a presentation on uh, physics of solar panels. Next slide, please. So this presentation is on indirect versus direct band gaps and how they can, how a indirect band gap is less efficient than a direct band gap. Next slide, please. Okay, so to begin, we're going to start with what a band gap is. A band gap, or the term band gap, refers to the difference in energy between the valence band, which is the outermost shell of electrons, and the conduction band, which is kind of a free flow of electrons between atoms. We are specifically talking about the highest amount of energy an electron can have in the valence band, and the lowest amount of energy an electron can have in the conduction band. And when you subtract those two numbers, you get the band gap. And on the image on the top right, on the left, sorry if that's a little confusing, but on the edge on the left, when there's a large band, band gap between the valence and conduction band, you have insulator, where electrons generally stay in the valence band because they don't have enough energy to jump between the band gap, which isn't useful for creating electricity. And on the right, when a band gap is very small to the point where it's zero or less than zero, you have a metal where electrons can move freely in the conduction band, but it's also not useful for generating electricity. So when there's a small enough band gap between the valence and conduction band, you have a semiconductor where electrons can jump between the valence and conduction band with the help of outside energy, such as a light photon. And we're going to specifically be focusing on semiconductors due to the fact that they play a major role in generating electricity. Next slide, please. So certain semiconductors, when exposed to light, its electrons absorb the extra energy, allowing the electrons to jump from the valence band to the conduction band, which generates an electric current. And band gaps are relevant in this due to the fact that light is a spectrum and not all light has the same amount of energy. So typically you want a smaller band gap so a photon with less energy can help an electron jump between the valence and conduction band. 
meaning that a sm the smaller the band gap, the larger the spectrum of light you can use to generate electricity, which increases the efficiency of a solar cell. And that is the basics of how band gaps work. Next slide, please. So on this slide, we have two graphs, which is a visual representation of direct on the left and indirect band gaps on the right. And what makes the difference between these types of band gaps is the momentum of electrons represented by K on the X axis. And you can see energy the electrons have on the Y axis. And as you can see with direct band gaps on the left, it isn't necessary to change momentum for an electron to jump from the valence band to the conduction band, meaning it only needs a photon or light energy to jump between the two bands. But with an indirect band gap on the right, the maximum amount of energy of the valence band doesn't occur at the same momentum as the minimum amount of energy on the conduction band, meaning the electron has to gain both enough energy and momentum to make a jump. And an electron can do this or gain the momentum with the addition of a phonon, which is a vibrational energy uh, that is typically found in crystals. So this overall means that direct band gap semiconductors use less energy to generate electricity because they only require a photon to make a jump, while a indirect band gap semiconductor uses more energy due to the fact that they require a photon and a phonon. So overall, a direct band gap semiconductor will be more efficient. Next slide, please. So here we have a list of different materials and their band gaps. This is a table from the University of Cambridge, and it lists different types of materials, what type of band gap they have, and the band gap energy in electron volts. And as you can see, some of the lowest band gaps on this chart are from direct band gap materials, which is the goal for achieving higher energy efficiencies. A notable example of the difference between these types of band gaps are the materials silicon and indium into monide. Silicon is, has a indirect band gap that takes 1.12 electron volts to make a jump, while indium antimonide has a direct band gap that takes 0.17 electron volts to make a jump. Next slide, please. So the big question is why aren't these direct band gap materials used more frequently? At the moment, 95% of solar panels use silicon to generate electricity. This is due to the fact that silicon is just extremely abundant. It is the second most abundant material in Earth's crust right behind oxygen. And in addition to that, solar cells have a high enough efficiency paired with a long lifespan and low cost. Silicon solar cells are simply cheap and effective. Although they aren't the most efficient, they still dominate the market. And if direct band gap materials ever want to compete with silicon solar cells in commercial power generation, they need to be cheaper and easier to manufacture. Next slide, please. Currently, direct band gap materials are mostly almost exclusively being used for space travel and for certain military drones. And this is because these solar panels are higher cost. And in these types of technology, they just need an insanely high uh, power generation efficiency and they don't care about the high cost. And they do this by using uh, junction solar cells which basically uses different materials with various band gaps to use the widest spectrum of light they can to generate electricity, which is an incredible method, but it simply isn't cost effective. And if we want to power our homes and businesses, then with these types of materials, then engineers and scientists will have to push the technology further. Next slide, please. And that's basically it for this presentation. All I have to say is I'd love to help push these techniques further. This summer I'm continuing with securities and as a technical research assistant so I can learn more about this field and gain experience. And after this summer, I'm hoping to go to a college with a good engineering program uh, so I can become a mechanical engineer and continue to work with renewable energy. And that's all I have today. Thank you so much for listening. This was a great presentation for me to learn. And yes. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you very much. We really appreciate the, the time and the effort that went into that presentation. And uh, we're learning a lot from all the students here tonight. And we are going to uh, now segue to our next student. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Lauren Rhodes, who will share with us her project. Lauren, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello all, my name is Lauren Rhodes. 
I'm a senior and active FFA member at Fort Defiance High School in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Next slide, please. Here in the Shenandoah Valley, I'm a multi-generational family farmer on our family commercial poultry farm, specifically raising turkeys. This is where I got the inspiration for my project. Next slide, please. Upon the introduction of the Throwing Solar Shade program, I was raised the question, how can solar panels re help reduce heat islands? I, of course, wanted to take an agriculture standpoint on this, developing the current question, can Orchard Hill Farms, an existing poultry farm, be converted to solar energy by putting solar panels on the roofs of the turkey houses? Next slide, please. While this is a very broad topic, I had to break it down into a couple important questions in order to make sure I fully understand it, understood this. Those questions include, what grants are available for farms going solar? Is going solar affordable for Orchard Hill Farms as well as other family farms? And lastly, can our houses handle the additional weight of solar panels? Next slide, please. One of the biggest hurdles I had to tackle was figuring out the affordability of such a costly investment. There are multiple government incentives to help farmers go solar. I would like to note to start though that these calculations were made in December of 2019. The tax credit percentage then was 30 percent and as of January 2021 that will be 22 percent, thus changing the totals that you now see on your screen. The federal tax credit, or also known as the investment tax credit, would help save money over time, as well as federal depreciation. The USDA also has a Rural Energy for America program, which offers grants that cover up to 25% of the total project and loans which cover up to 75% for ag producers whose income is more than 50% ag based annually. We at Orchard Hill Farms received a proposal to add solar panels to the roof of our litter shed, as well as a standing array in a nearby sheep field. Sheep are the only livestock, which we happen to raise, that can graze under solar panels and not bother them in any way. The total cost of this project is a whopping $133,764. After federal tax credit, as well as federal depreciation, the net cost after those incentives is $58,388. However, I would like to remind you that we would have to pay that whopping $133,000 sum before any of the project could even could continue. And that money would be saved over time, not upfront. Next slide, please. As you can see here, this is the litter shed that we received a proposal to put our solar panels onto. It is a fairly new building, so the structural integrity is not an issue factoring this in. Next slide, please. Structural integrity is something, however, that I had to look into when adding solar panels to our poultry houses. The live load, more commonly known as the snow load, was one of the biggest variants that I struggled with. Snow can weigh up to two pounds per square foot. Those variants depend on the amount of moisture that's in the air when the snow falls. Adding solar panels would add take away from that live load. However, their darker color would help absorb sunlight, therefore melting the snow, reducing that live load. However, if it's like a day like today we have here in the valley, the snow is not going anywhere due to the lack of sunlight. The dead load is the amount of weight that is currently suspended from the trusses and remains there constantly, thus being roofing material as well as the equipment that we have hanging on the inside of the turkey houses. This includes feed lines, drinkers, and climate control equipment such as heaters and fans. Adding solar panels would be adding about three pounds per square foot. Our current trusses are designed to hold maximum 30, 37 and a half to 40 pounds per square foot. However, when building new poultry houses, you could increase the number of trusses you have, decreasing from a four foot center, which is standard, to three or two foot centers, thus increasing your max capacity for your weight. Next slide, please. 
as you can see here, I plugged some information into PV watts, which would calculate putting solar panels across the whole entire roof of our largest poultry house, which is 600 feet long and 50 feet wide. I would like to note, however, that we would not do this as that would compromise the structural integrity of our building. However, I wanted to do so to give you an idea. The projected value of how much energy this would create is equal to about $44,000 annually. Next slide, please. Here you can see an aerial view of our poultry houses, and I would like to note that they are running north to south, so each side of the roofs are facing east and west. Solar panels would gather sunlight in each half of the day. Next slide, please. In conclusion, through my project, I found that upfront, solar is a very costly investment, especially for family farmers who are already in a risky business, spending a lot of money upfront. However, there are government incentives, grants, and loans to help farmers such as myself, as well as the 95% of American agriculturalists who are family farmers across the US. However, not all farmers want to go solar, specifically because of the risk and the high investment rates. Looking into the structural integrity, I found that our roofs might be able to hold the added weight. However, increased support may be needed and overall, if you're looking to add solar panels to a current house, you might want to consult a structural engineer to be sure that your buildings can hold the added weight. Next slide, please. Next slide. Moving forward, as you can tell, I'm a very active member of the Future Farmers of America, or FFA. I plan on using this presentation in the AgriScience Fair in the Research Division for natural resources. I also plan on using this presentation to apply for many agri-science proficiencies, as I have been an activist working with local family farmers to learn more about how they are going solar. I also plan to use my voice as an advocate for agriculture as I continue with an internship with Secure Futures in the summer of 2021, working as their business development research assistant, focusing in power purchase agreements and using those to possibly find a financial solution for the ag sector and family farmers using my family farm as a prototype. I would like to thank you all very much for watching my presentation and thank you for the opportunity. It's been amazing. Great, thank you very much for that presentation and for the, the heartfelt work that went into that project as uh, has been the case with all of our students. It's been really fantastic to hear about these uh, uh, exciting solar leaders of tomorrow and the great work that they've done. And we are now going to transition to uh, our uh, our next speaker. And it, it gives me a uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeremy Hoffman, who is the chief scientist at the Science Museum of Virginia and affiliate faculty in the L. Douglas Wilder School and the Center for Environmental Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University. Dr. Hoffman connects audiences to their changing planet through community science campaigns and interactive hands-on and immersive experiences. And with that, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Jeremy Hoffman to the Solar Decathlon virtual stage. Dr. Hoffman, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for that introduction. I'm so, so thrilled to be able to share this webinar space with these distinguished students all of their work has been fantastic. They should be so proud of themselves. And um, I'm just so thrilled to get to, to have seen all of you go through the Throwing Solar Shade program uh, uh, successfully and to hear about your plans for the future because truthfully, you and your drive in this sector is going to uh, amount to such innovation and promise uh, for a better tomorrow. So, so uh, from, from uh, from here uh, at the Science Museum of Virginia, please like, thank you so much for, for sharing uh, your work with us. And so I wanted to just cap off this discussion with a little bit about, you know, why uh, deepening our appreciation for why the urban heat island effect is something that we should be worried about, as well as how it fits in to the greater discussion about solar uh, as, a, as a mitigating um, uh, intervention for extreme heat as well as helping reduce carbon emissions, which 
uh, are, are the uh, primary uh, reason why planetary temperatures are going up. So um, uh, we know that uh, climate change uh, needs kind of all hands on deck. We need kind of silver buckshot, not just a silver bullet. So let's dive in and, and take a look at a closer level. So uh, next slide, please. We all know, uh, you know, that this kind of landscape is very common. Uh, you know, it, we, we see it probably every day. If we get out of our cars, maybe some of us have been working from home, but others of, of us uh, still commute to work. And so we have these large parking lots, as you learned from uh, presentation earlier that these tend to absorb more of the sun's energy and then re-radiate it back out as heat. Uh, but we had to see a lot of interesting stuff going on in this landscape when we take a thermal photo of it. Please, next slide. As we can see that um, heat doesn't express itself one way everywhere. The brighter temperature or the brighter colors here are, bright, are uh, hotter temperatures and the cooler temperatures are the darker colors. There's huge differences in our built environment brought on by how humans design their landscapes, how we design our cities where uh, more of the human built surfaces like brick, asphalt, and cement uh, are much, much warmer during uh, extreme heat events, especially uh, than our natural landscapes, things like the trees and the bushes and these native plants here uh, across the street from where these folks are walking across the landscape. And so when we think about how we de we've designed our cities, we tend to think about things being dominated by these sorts of surfaces. But um, what does this mean to uh, the impacts of climate change? Well, we know that uh, summers are getting warmer, heat waves are getting more intense and longer and stronger, and that has a direct impact on our lives as people. The next slide, please. You might be surprised to find out that extreme heat is the leading cause of weather-related fatalities in the country. Uh, it's really a silent killer. Uh, much more substantial than the kind of more charismatic storms that we see presented on uh, on the nightly news, like hurricanes and tornadoes. And next slide. We know that these uh, extreme heat illnesses and deaths befall uh, more vulnerable and minoritized people in our lives. In 1995, famous Chicago heat wave tended to uh, really only affect communities that were uh, poorer and communities of color. Uh, so we know that during heat waves these days, these disproportionately impact those of us around us with less than uh, the ability to cope and adapt to those changing environmental conditions. And so what can we do about it? Well, uh, next slide, we can go out and actually assess temperatures, um, both from space using satellites and thermal cameras. We can also go on the you know, ground level and uh, recruit volunteer scientists and uh, especially teenage uh, high school students like Ajana here in this picture that was featured in the Richmond Times-Dispatch. We had um, uh, teens involved from Groundwork uh, RVA that joined the Science Museum of Virginia and a few other community partners to assess the urban heat island in the city of Richmond. Next slide, please. We found a 16 degree Fahrenheit difference between the coolest and warmest place on the exact same day during the heat wave. 16 degrees Fahrenheit. That's way more than uh, than what uh, you know we see sometimes even during uh, the course of an entire day. Now, these extremely warmer areas overlap with places where the Richmond Ambulance Authority goes to more often for heat-related illnesses. This is actually the map on the right is a map of where ambulances have been going to respond to heat-related illnesses. The overlap is quite stark and surprising. So next slide, please. The question then is like, how can solar help this or potentially not? Because uh, the obvious need is that we need to reduce our carbon emissions by about 50% by 2030 to avoid tripping that one and a half degrees Celsius warming target set by the Paris Climate Agreement. But so, so what, what is some of the recent academic studies telling us about how solar can either fight or amplify the urban heat island effect? Next slide, please. The first study that I'm sharing here is from uh, uh, a study in Arizona where they showed that a, a photovoltaic plant was regularly about six to eight degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the surrounding wildlands at night and really underscored the, the, uh, um, the role that underlying land uses and surrounding land uses play in either amplifying or dampening that photovoltaic heat island effect. Next paper, or next slide please. The next one uh, explored how distributing solar panels panels on Paris rooftops actually re resolved in uh, reducing the energy need for air conditioning as well as reducing the urban heat island effect through shading the rooftops that would otherwise be very warm. So that's that's a promising result that we get from this one study. The next uh, slide please. 
The last study uh, looked at the installation of photovoltaic systems over the entire city of Sydney, Australia, and this reduced maximum summertime temperatures by up to a degree Celsius, or around two degrees Fahrenheit. And they showed that this has a positive economic impact of up to three and a half million dollars Australian. And that was depending on the intensity of the photovoltaic systems that they deploy. So what's really interesting about this is that, next slide please, I think ultimately what we can agree on is that solar and the technology that we can use to fight the uh, urban heat island effect as well as climate change result in a bunch of co-benefits for, uh, for everyone involved and everywhere that they're uh, uh, placed. And what's really great for the students on this call is that there's so much more science to do. We have so much more discovery ahead of us and you are going to be involved in making those innovations and discovering those earth uh, changing uh, uh, discoveries. And so I'm so glad to have been involved with you in this and, uh, and thank you so much for allowing me to share my perspective on this call. The final slide please is just how you can reach out to me if you'd like to. Um, th so thank you so much students and, and, and conveners. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Hoffman. We appreciate your time tonight and uh, and your contributions and your work with the students. And now is the time for people to ask their questions about the presentations that have been given this evening. You again can either virtually raise your hand or you can chat in your question. And with that, I'm actually gonna turn things over in the few minutes that we have left to my colleague, Tyler, who has access to those functions and the questions that have been sent in. So Tyler, I'm gonna, gonna turn things over to you to see what questions have come in uh, for our presenters. Thank you, Jonathan, um, and thank you to our presenters and to our audience for submitting your questions, of which we do have several. Uh, jump, jumping into the queue, I see we had one from, uh, from Jeff. Uh, I believe this one is um, is for Sherilyn um, because he asked, "What is the cost of non-slip paint?" Uh, we have lots of rain in Central California, uh, and paint would need to be like sidewalk paint so as not to create a safety hazard. So there are actually a lot of different options with the paints. That's why my price range was so wide, because you have your water-based paints, you have alcohol-based paints. But for Fort Defiance, we were we use um, acrylic-based, water-based acrylic paints for painting in our parking lot. And I have noticed that they've been able to withstand lots of weather conditions that we have here in Augusta County because our weather here is extremely unpredictable. But we don't we've never had any issues of the parking lot paint chipping away or going away even after about a year. And so I would recommend looking into the different paints that you have access to. And also if Cool Seal is within your budget, I highly recommend looking into that option as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, a question from Ryan, and um, I think this might be relevant to both Caroline and Jack, uh, because he asked uh, if there are any examples of projects that have used perovskites, uh, apologies if I'm mispronouncing that word, at a large scale. So there are, in fact, a lot of experiments that involve perovskites. One researcher who has published many articles on this is Dr. Henry Snape. And he is a researcher that has been doing this project since about 2009. So yeah, the use of perovskites is widespread. However, it hasn't been publicized because of the fact that perovskites can contain lead. So what scientists are trying to do right now is remove that by replacing them with halides. And in order to do that, it's going to take some more time, but afterwards they'll be more publicized and hopefully incorporated into solar cells that are pre-existing. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, just trying to jump in. I know we do want to keep the time. Uh, we're about four minutes to our scheduled end time, and we have more questions than that. So um, I would encourage anyone, if we don't get to your questions today, I'll be sending a follow-up email um, with a link to this recording, as well as all of the other recordings for Solar Decathlon webinars. And of course, that will contain contact information. So feel free to get in touch. Um, so a question for uh, Caroline and Jack. Uh, would you see possibilities for your research interests converging on solar panel efficiency in developing direct band perovskite solar panels? For me, uh, I actually, oh, okay, go ahead, Jack. No, it's fine, you go, Caroline. 
Okay, um, you can jump in after this, but yeah, there have actually been experiments that combine different aspects of thermophotovoltaic cells, direct band gap cells, and perovskite cells to increase the efficiency and pass the Shockley-Kaiser limit. So these cells can work in tandem, and there are plenty of experiments that have shown that it is possible. Jack? And I'd just like to say, in addition, we're both secure, are interning with Secure Futures this summer, so I'm sure there's going to be a lot of opportunities to work together together on this type of research. So that's very exciting. Excellent and very fortuitous. Uh, question from Audrey, or I'm sorry, um, yes, from Audrey for Lauren. Do you think that solar panels for agriculture will be able to be used for other types of farms, uh, for example, cattle, sheep, and other livestock? That is a very good question and something that I've looked into as well. As previously mentioned, of course, um, a standing array can be put in a sheep field as sheep do not bother solar standing solar arrays in any way, shape or form. In terms of using it for beef or dairy operations, there's actually a dairy operation in Rockingham County that is operated with solar energy. Um, but in terms of adding it to a beef operation, Lots of farmers have a feedlot or a large barn that they use for shelter for their cattle, as well as a feeding area for them. And solar panels could very easily be added to those barns as some of them are farther out in remote areas so that they can use electricity to operate electric waters and other essentials that may be needed out in those barns. Tyler, you might be on mute, but thank you very much for uh, I was. your question. I apologize, Jonathan. I was just saying that with our uh, remaining 60 seconds, I will uh, thank our audience, our presenters, and turn it back over to you to lead us out for the evening. Great. Thank you very much, Tyler. And thank you very much to all the people who sent in questions. We really appreciate your participation on tonight's program and uh, also want to just give a very, very warm Dewey Solar Decathlon uh, welcome to all of our presenters and their uh, the fantastic program that they have participated in. Uh, it has just really been impressive to hear all the presentations. And uh, as Tyler said, this webinar uh, has been recorded and it will be posted to the solardecathlon.gov website uh, shortly. So with that, we are at the top of the hour. So thank you again to everybody. We really appreciate your time your presentations and your dedication to these issues. Uh, we are clearly uh, optimistic uh, about the future with our participants on tonight's program. So with that, thank you all very much. Have a very good night.